The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar on the first steps towards GDPR compliance. As you wake up on Christmas morning, you'll be able to know that there is just five months left to the date by when all organizations across the 28 current member states of the European Union need to comply with GDPR. My name is Alan Calder. I'm the founder and executive chairman of IT Governance, and I'll be your host this afternoon uh, while we take a first look at the areas on which a compliance program needs to focus and why it needs to be doing that. My background is in data security and information compliance over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, the company I originally set up uh, is IT Governance, founded on the basis of a book I wrote about how to implement an information security management system. And uh, that book has gone on to be the uh, postgraduate textbook at the Open University in its sixth edition, uh, spawned a whole series of other books on uh, related subjects and of course IT governance which as a company has grown very substantially to be a global one-stop shop for everything to do with uh, information security, data protection and uh, GDPR and that means that we provide services not just to do with IT service management, ITIL, project management and so on but much more substantially with business continuity, incident management, penetration testing, PCI, uh, cyber resilience and of course ISO 27001 and the general data protection regulation. If you will, it's a single uh, entity. We're a single place where you can go to get everything that you might need to be able to get yourself GDPR compliant in a package of products and services that's appropriate for your organization and the way you want to uh, address the challenges ahead of you. We're going to have a brief overview of the regulatory landscape, the principles of the General Data Protection Regulation, how breach notification and data subject rights work under the new regime. Uh, we'll have a look at changes around consent, liabilities on processes and the responsibilities of data controllers, the role of the data protection officer, uh, a brief look at international transfers and of course how this new regulation is going to be made to operate consistently in theory at least across the whole of the European Union. At the uh, end of the webinar I'm going to be talking for about 45 or 50 minutes there'll be an opportunity to ask questions if you have questions that occur to you as we're going through the webinar, please do use the uh, questions function in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. You'll see a box marked questions. If you uh, open that box, you can type questions into that. Do type them in as and when you think of them. When we get to the Q&A section, what I'll do is I'll start at the beginning. I'll read out the first question and then I'll share the answer uh, for everybody. And I'll get through as many questions as I can in whatever time we still have available for us to finish by four o'clock. And the first question usually asked is, will these slides be available? Yes, they'll be available to everybody who's registered uh, on the webinar. They usually go out uh, several days uh, after the webinar itself. So starting point is, uh, how does European Union law work? If you don't know, there are essentially two types of law. One's a directive and the other is a regulation. Uh, directives are essentially the European Commission telling member state governments about a law they have to bring in, setting out minimum requirements of the law, but essentially leaving it up to the member state to determine how to enact that directive into its own uh, local canon of laws. The existing UK Data Protection Act, uh, 1998 it was passed into UK law, is the UK's uh, implementation of the data protection directive, the EU's data protection directive. Regulations, on the other hand, go into force as written. They don't depend on enabling legislation from member states, although member states are obviously entitled to pass a law which puts the 
uh, regulation into effect, but it has to go into effect as written. It can't be translated into different legal terms. These are the terms. Uh, regulations do typically have areas within which member states are able to exercise some discretion. Uh, derogations, for instance, around the age of consent for children is one such, but a regulation and the general data protection regulation is exactly as the title suggests a regulation. So it goes into force across all 28 member states in exactly the same way on exactly the same date, irrespective of whether the member states are concerned past their own enabling laws. In the United Kingdom, the GDPR is the main body of the current data protection bill, which is working its way through Parliament. Uh, and the government tells us that the reason why it's legislating right now is to make it clear that GDPR will continue applying after Brexit when, uh, in practical terms, all European Union law will fall away. The GDPR will not. It will already have been made part of British law as distinct from being European law enforced in Britain. The model for data protection under GDPR looks a bit like this. There are data subjects. That's uh, you and me. Uh, we own our own data is the starting point for GDPR. And therefore, if we give our data to a data controller, that's an entity, uh, could be uh, an individual, a group of individuals, but mostly it'll be a company, uh, an organization that chooses to collect data from us. We're entitled to have that data protected. The data controller might outsource some of the processing to a data processor, uh, or it might transfer it to a data processor in a third country. In either instance, there are very specific obligations in place to ensure that our personal data is properly protected. Data can come to a controller directly from the data subject, or uh, at times it can come from a third Party. It's still legal to buy uh, a mailing list. It's still legal to collect information that's available in the public domain. But there are very specific rules about what you have to do with that data before you begin using it. In all instances, the uh, recognition that controllers have duties in respect to data which they collect and data subjects have rights is the key part of how this regulation is going to pan out. The supervisory authority, every member state has a supervisory authority who for the United Kingdom will be the information commissioner, has the power to assess compliance and to enforce compliance. Security, guarantees, disclosure, transparency, and protection uh, are intended to be part of the fabric of data protection wherever it takes place. The European Data Protection Board exists to make sure that supervisory authorities interpret the regulation consistently across Europe, which should mean that in all member states, a data subject knows that they have exactly the same rights and should mean that controllers or processes operating anywhere in the European Union know they have only one set of requirements with which they have to comply. In scope for GDPR is all personal data. Personal data is uh, anything that can be used to identify a natural individual, a living person. So uh, an email address, alancalder at gmail.com is clearly going to identify me, it's personal data. But GDPR makes no distinction between consumer data and business data. So alancalder at itgovernance.com also identifies me uh, and therefore it is within the scope for GDPR. So if under Data Protection Act, you think that there is a way that you can ignore, person, ignore personal identification in business accounts, you can't. The only aspect that you can treat as being outside the scope is a corporate email address like info at itgovernance.com. That doesn't identify anybody. It's the um, identifier for a legal entity, not for a uh, natural person, so it's outside scope. Natural persons have rights to the protection of their data, to the protection of the systems within which they're processed, and to the unrestricted movement of their data inside the European Union. And those rights apply to personal data that's processed wholly or partly by automated means, or that is part of or is meant to be part of a filing system. By definition, therefore, 
GDPR applies to data that's on paper just as much as it does to data which is in digital format. If it's personal information, if it's a business card and it's going to be part of a structured filing system, then it's within scope. If it's a business card and it's being left in your pocket, then it's not because it's not part of a, not intended to be part of a structured filing system. So virtually anything that identifies, not virtually anything that identifies a natural person in any format is within the scope for GDPR. And any organization that is collecting data wherever it is in the world of European Union residents as a result of providing services into the European Union has to comply with GDPR. Any processes that are providing services to controllers in the European Union have to comply with GDPR. So to a very real extent, GDPR is the first global data protection regulation. And it's enforced by some pretty hefty fines. The uh, administrative, what are called administrative fines, fines that can be imposed by the regulator for breaches of GDPR can go up to 10 million euros or up to 2% of the uh, total global annual turnover for a wide range of uh, issues, all of which are identified, uh, what you might call the lower tariff, and they can go up to 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover for breaches in the core areas of uh, the data application of the data processing principles, the protection of data subject rights and transgressions in respect of transborder data processing. So key areas that uh, carry the highest level of fines. Bear in mind, these are not minimum fines, they are maximum fines. The regulation says up to, uh, that means the supervisory authorities will take account of both the extent of negligence in the organization, but also the extent to which the organization has made appropriate steps to deal with breaches and issues. And all of that has to be taken into account to ensure the fine is proportionate to the uh, extent of the transgression has to be dissuasive, uh, but also has to be proportionate. So what is a personal data breach? A personal data breach is defined very clearly in GDPR as any breach of the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of information, which means that it is not available for or cannot be used for the purposes for which it was originally processed. And the problem with a data breach from the point of view of a data controller is if you have one, you have to report it. If you're a data processor, you also have to report it, but you only have to report it to the controller with whom you have a contract. You have to report the data breach as soon as you discover it, certainly within 72 hours, and you have to report all data breaches to the controller with whom you have a contract no exceptions. The data controller has to report breaches to the supervisory authority only if there is a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So it's entirely possible that a data controller will look at a, a breach, carry out an assessment, decide there is no risk to the rights and freedoms, and therefore decide that it does not need to be reported to the ICO. That's perfectly reasonable. You want to make sure you have a documented process for doing that, records of how you've done it so that on a later investigation, you're able to demonstrate that you carried out your duties correctly. The data controller also has to notify data subjects if there is a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. And uh, that means notifying them by email, by telephone, by whatever means are possible. If that's too expensive or too complicated, then you would notify them by uh, means of a social media announcement or a press announcement or whatever is sure to give them as quickly as possible enough information for them to deal with their risks and exposures. So data controllers. No need to notify if there's no risk. Uh, no risk might be because the data itself is encrypted, so it can't be accessed. Uh, if there is a risk, you have to notify the supervisory authority, the information commissioner. If there's a high risk, you have to notify the data subjects themselves. That means you need to have a risk assessment methodology. You need to have a formal mechanism for determining which of the levels the uh, risk falls into. And GDPR comes into force on the 25th of May, 2018. It was uh, passed into, uh, it applies 
uh, from the 25th of May, it was passed into law uh, by the 24th of May two years ago. Uh, we're now very nearly uh, 18 months through the transition period. Uh, there's a significant amount of work which has to be done because you need to be in compliance on the 25th. It's not a, we need to start complying after that, but you need to be in compliance. That means that all of the data you're currently processing and which you may be processing legally under the Data Protection Act, but will be illegal under the General Data Protection Regulation, you've got uh, now less than six months to make sure that you convert the basis of processing so that you can comply with GDPR. The good news is that complying with GDPR in advance will still be complying with the Data Protection Act. There's no downside to getting your compliance activity in place early. So, it all starts with the rights of uh, data subjects and the uh, rights of data subjects start with the rights to be informed about what you're doing with their data, the rights to have access to it, to see what it is that you're doing with their data, the right to rectify anything which you've got wrong, the rights to require data to be erased if the purpose for which it was originally collected has now passed, what's called the right to be forgotten, the right to restrict processing while there's an argument going on over whether it should be corrected or not, uh, the right to object to processing if they disagree with the reason why you wanted to process it, uh, the right to uh, have their data given back to them in machine-readable format to take to some other supplier in the European Union, and the right to be informed of the existence of automated decision-making or profiling, particularly if it's going to have legal consequences for them. Not all of these rights are absolute, some of them are, but for instance, the right to erasure and the right to data portability, those are not absolute rights, but they are both triggered by consent. We'll look shortly at the issue of lawfulness of processing, and if the basis on which you're processing data is consent, then the data subject automatically has the right to withdraw consent, as well as the right to erasure and the right to uh, data portability. Those rights are not automatically triggered in the same way under other circumstances. So, the six data processing principles. The Data Protection Act has eight. Uh, in GDPR, that's reduced to six because the transport and data flow uh, requirements go to a separate chapter of their own, as does the uh, set of uh, personal rights. They also go to a separate chapter of their own. So, to a very real extent, it's the same core six principles as they were in the Data Protection Act, in which, in theory, uh, with which, in theory, everybody is currently in compliance, but in reality, not necessarily so much but they're extended and made clearer. And the starting point when thinking about the six data processing principles is really the second principle, which is that personal data must be collected for a specified, explicit, and legitimate purpose. And if you can determine specifically what you want to collect the data for, and you've got to think of data as being not just a whole long list of stuff about a person, but data is name and address. Another data item might be bank account details. A third data item might be health information. A fourth data item might be uh, biometric information. Each of those elements of data, you need to be able to determine specifically what you need to collect the data for. If you can't identify a specific reason, you can't collect it. Um, you need to be explicit about what it is. You can't say we have business purposes generally, that's not explicit. And the purposes also need to be legitimate. And the legitimate is described in GDPR. There are a number of items of collection which are legitimate. Um, so direct marketing is a legitimate interest. Um, keeping customers informed about products and services is a legitimate interest. Dealing with fraud is a legitimate interest. If you're clear about the specific, explicit, and legitimate purposes for which you're collecting it, then determining the lawful uh, and the lawful basis of processing is fairly straightforward, making sure you're doing it fairly so there's no shocks and surprises for the data subject and that you're transparent. It's very easy for the data subject to understand what you're doing and why follows logically, as do the other principles, that the data you collect will be adequate for the purpose. You'll keep it accurate uh, in terms of the purpose for which you collected it, but you'll and you'll only keep it for as long as is necessary for the purpose. You can't, having collected data in order to make a decision on whether you're going to employ somebody or not, for which perhaps the 
period during which you might keep it is six months after making a decision not to offer them a job. You can't decide thereafter to keep it uh, in case uh, you decide that uh, you might want to approach them at some point in the future about a job because that's not the basis on which you collect the data. You can if you go back to them and say, I've got a different reason. I'd like to keep the data. How's, how do you feel about that? And of course, finally, the data must be processed in a way that will maintain security. What GDPR says is that across those six principles, the controller has to demonstrate that it is in compliance with the requirement to be accountable. So you can think almost of accountability as being like a seventh principle. You have to be able to show as an organization that you're accountable for the processing of data in line with those six data processing principles, which surely means it starts with the board, it starts with senior management saying, yep, we're going to make sure GDPR is embedded in our organization. We have proper processes in place. You have an accountable director. You appoint an executive who's responsible for making sure data protection is organized. And you make sure it becomes part of how the organization operates on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, in fact, is what the information commissioner is looking for. She said in a speech back in January this year to the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales that the principle of accountability means that GDPR is not about box ticking. It's about building a framework that ensures that a culture of privacy pervades the entire organization. It mandates organizations to put in place comprehensive but proportionate governance measures uh, and to make sure that data protection becomes part of the company's overall systems approach to how it manages and processes personal data. So that's a significant ask. It's saying don't treat data protection as just something you do at the end of the process. Uh, can you prove that you've kind of paid attention to it? It has to become a fundamental part of what you do. And if you think about the power of, inf of the supervisory authorities to levy fines where you failed to embed data protection. You can see why uh, many organizations are already quite substantially advanced on their GDPR compliance programs. So what does applying the principle look like? As I said, it obviously implies obviously uh, indicates that you're going to have GDPR on the corporate risk register. It's going to be on the board agenda. There'll be an accountable uh, director on the board who makes sure that the organization is dealing with GDPR and reports to colleagues about progress. Uh, there will be clear roles and responsibilities in everybody's job descriptions. There'll be a data protection officer, either man a mandatory data protection officer, we'll look at that shortly, or you'll appoint a data protection officer because it just kind of makes practical sense. You'll build what we call a privacy compliance framework. That's combining an information security management system with a personal information management system, the documents that ensure that you've got a proper data protection policy, uh, audits and so on, which and that ties into how you manage information security. All of that's supported by records of processing, a description created now that describes what data you're processing through the organization, what the lawful basis of doing is, all set out in Article 30 of GDPR, supported by a cyber incident response process. Remember the obligation to report data breaches. Uh, to do that effectively, you need to identify them first. You need to have a method of reporting them uh, centrally so that you can review, decide what you've got to do um, and, and respond. Uh, and external standards like Cyber Essentials, um, ISO 27001, where there is an external standard to which you can get a certification from a, an independent organization are seen as very practical, sensible ways to demonstrate that you've done everything you could practically do to meet the requirements to put in place appropriate technical and organizational safeguards. GDPR, in fact, talks about the idea of data protection by design and by default. It's not just in the principle of accountability. It's a specific requirement. A specific requirement, which therefore means that uh, while some organizations have to do a data protection impact assessment, uh, you have to do one if you're processing large volumes of uh, special categories of data, you're monitoring people on a large scale in a public area, um, you're uh, creating new technology processes which create high risks for, for, for rights of natural persons. Um, 
you should still be thinking about it doing a DPIA, even if you're not captured by the mandatory areas. A DPIA is how you take a process to pieces, uh, determine where the risks are to data subjects, and then rebuild it to make sure that the risks are reduced. Data flow audits is the step before a data protection impact assessment. It's what you do across the organization as a whole to make sure you've identified all of the ways in which data is collected and dealt with, and that you can therefore, in looking at impacts on the rights and freedoms of natural persons, make appropriate steps. So we've mentioned uh, lawfulness. Article 6 of GDPR deals very specifically with uh, lawfulness. In the UK, we're used to the idea that we process data by consent. Uh, most websites will offer uh, consent as a lawful basis, either pre-ticked or to be ticked. If you're going to rely on consent, it can't be pre-ticked under GDPR. It will have to be freely given. And the problem with freely given is that uh, it has to be given by one party who's got an equal standing to the other, which means that you can't consent to the processing of your data by a public authority. There's not an equality of standing. And you can't consent to the processing of your data by your employer, because again, the employer is seen as being not in an equal position to you, but more powerfully. So that means that if you have, um, all your employees, your data is being their data is being processed on the basis of consent. Between now and the 25th of May next year, you need to have put in place an alternative lawful basis of processing, have talked to the data subjects about it, and got it in place effectively. And in fact, as you begin to look at it, you discover that consent shouldn't be the starting point, the default lawful basis, but perhaps the one that you turn to if nothing else can be made to work. The Alternatives include, for instance, the processing that you need to do in order to meet a contract you have with a data subject. That's the basis on which a lot of the data in an employment contract will be processed. You've got a contract, you need data like name, address, bank details in order to perform your part of the contract. You need delivery details if you're delivering a fridge to someone who's bought it. You don't need their consent for the delivery details. You going to tell them that you're processing that data. You, you have to have it from them in order for you to carry out the contract. Data subjects are entitled to object when you don't ask for consent, when you have a different lawful basis, and you can, under those circumstances, tell them the consequences of objecting. If you rely on consent, when they withdraw consent, you have to stop processing the data unless you have an overriding statutory uh, obligation that uh, enables you to retain the data. But the first challenge is the very high bar for consent. Can you actually rely on it? Will it be a valid lawful basis? And then the second is the ramifications of the withdrawal of consent. And we'll look at consent again in a minute. The decision about what the lawful basis of processing should be is made by a controller. And controllers and processors are both now defined for the first time in law with clearly defined obligations. The controller is the entity that uh, determines the means and purposes of processing. A processor acts under direction from a controller. Processors, in fact, will not legally be allowed to process data unless they have a contract from a controller. The good news for a processor is if you have a contract and you're acting within the bounds of the contract and there's a breach, you're not going to be liable for the breach. Only the controller is going to be liable because it's their contract. You're just doing what uh, you have been paid to do. So consent is a very high bar for consent, and the uh, requirement is that you can demonstrate consent was given. You can't rely on pre-ticked boxes or consent by default. Silence in activity doesn't constitute consent. There has to be a positive action which the data subject takes that indicates that they're giving consent, and they knew they were giving consent. So the Description of what they're consenting to must be made easily available, must be accessible, must be in plain language, and it must be as easy to withdraw consent at any time as it was to give consent. And when they withdraw consent is when you have to stop the processing to which they'd consented. There are special conditions for people under the age of 16. In general, GDPR says that unless a member state chooses a derogation, people under the age of 16 may not validly or lawfully consent to the processing of their data in relation to a, an information society service. 
That means they can't sign up to social media uh, under the age of 16 unless, as in the UK, a member state has decided on a lower age. And the lowest age you can decide on is 13. The UK has opted for 13. That's the age set out in the current data protection bill. It means that anybody in the UK 13 years or younger uh, who wants to consent to the processing of their data in a social media or similar site may not. Uh, they have to get a uh, legal guardian or parent to uh, give permission. And that means the onus is very clearly on the data controller to ensure that it can evidence that it got consent from someone in a position to give consent, not uh, said 12-year-old uh, year old friend. So special conditions apply to children consenting. These, this regulation is only here talking about consenting to processing of data for information society services, does not affect any other legal consents that the law of a member state might allow a minor to agree to. And then Article 9, which has to be thought of at the same time as Articles 6 and 6, 7 and 8, says that special categories of data, what we used to think of as sensitive data and DPA, but there are special categories of data under GDPR, uh, and which include not just uh, gender, um, race, ethnic origin, uh, but also include political beliefs, health information, biometrics, genetics, and so on. It is prohibited to process that data unless you can identify an exception to the prohibition. And the exceptions are listed in Article 9. Uh, they include the explicit consent of the data subject, uh, the data necessary to fulfill a contract with the data subject, uh, the vital interests of the data subject, and so on. You need to be able to identify both an Article 6 lawful basis of processing and an Article 9 exception to the prohibition where special categories of data are concerned. So the whole business of lawfulness and consent is very significant and you need to put time in, you need to work with your professional advisors to make sure that you're tackling that in the most sensible way possible. Articles 12 through 18 deal with transparency. You remember the first principle says that processing must be lawful, fair, and transparent. What transparent means is described in these articles. The uh, communication must be concise, intelligent, intelligible, uh, clear to read, easy to understand. Uh, all of the information that the data subject might need to access should be there. They need the data subjects entitled to know who you are as a controller. They're entitled to know who else will see the data, who you're going to be contracting with to process the data, or who you're going to share the data with. All of that has to be in the privacy notice, what we currently call a privacy policy will in effect become a privacy notice. And the requirements around privacy notice are set out in articles 13 and 14. Article 13 deals with data that you collect directly from data subjects. Article 14 deals with data which is collected not from the data subject, but from a third party, such as in the public's public domain or from a mailing list provider or uh, anybody like that. At the same time as telling data subjects what you plan to do with their data, you have to remind them what their rights are and tell them how you facilitate the exercise by the data subject of those rights. All of that has to be very clearly and transparently set out for the data subject. Article 25 then goes on to talk about embedding data protection by design and by default in the organization. It must be designed into your processes. Uh, as we've seen, data controllers and processes outside the European Union have to comply with GDPR. In fact, they have to go further than that. They have to appoint a representative inside the European Union to whom a data subject can bring a complaint or to whom a uh, supervisory authority can go to deal with an issue that arises in relation to the processing of that controller. One uh, interesting thing to bear in mind is the GDPR isn't restricted in terms of the uh, nationality of the people whose data is being processed. It simply says if you're a controller or processor based in the European Union or based outside the European Union providing services into it, you have to comply with the GDPR in respect of all residents of the European Union, irrespective of nationality or place of residence. 
Article 35 talks again about data protection impact assessments. We've touched on them already. DPIA is a mandatory where you're deploying new technology that may have a high risk to rights and freedoms, where you're processing high volumes of special categories of data, or you're uh, uh, monitoring on a large scale a public uh, area. Data protection impact assessments are a solid part of data protection by design and by default. You need to be thinking about data audits. Those are requirements in GDPR that uh, the organization, having become compliant, maintains compliance. Uh, that means continuing to carry out audits that will ensure that through the organization, the requirements are being met. GDPR compliance audits should become part of the internal control framework, part of the business management system or the ISO 9001 management system. And that means that you may have to go and redesign a number of your processes your existing processes around how data is collected and dealt with, how audits are carried out, how security is managed, to make sure that by the time you get to the 25th of May, all of the data you're processing at that point is being processed in compliance with the requirements of GDPR. Which brings us on to Article 32, which is dealing with the security of personal data. Six principle says that personal data has to be processed securely. Article 32 talks in much more detail about what that means. However, it doesn't give you anything that looks like clear and definitive guidance. What it says is that you have to implement a level of security that's appropriate to the risk and doesn't tell you how to work that out. So uh, the appropriate security, says GDPR, could be pseudonymization and encryption of personal data could be anything that's necessary to ensure the ongoing confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems and all of the data that's inside them is likely to involve regularly testing, assessing, and evaluating the effectiveness of your systems and of your security measures. And those security measures should be part of the data protection by design approach rather than bolted on afterwards. So the requirement is very strongly that information security becomes a significant or core part of the data protection regime. The clue, after all, is in the name. It's the data protection regulation, not just the data compliance regulations. So you've got to protect data in a way that enables you to demonstrate compliance with GDPR. And as I've said before, standards, uh, national and international standards like Cyber Essentials and ISO, IEC 27001 are standards and frameworks to which an organization can work, against which it can be independently assessed and audited, and which can be used to demonstrate that you've made appropriate steps to meet your GDPR obligations around data security. All of those components go together to create what we call a privacy compliance framework. And a privacy compliance framework ties together the personal information management system, the documentation around uh, internal audits, around data protection policies, um, around how records are kept, with your information security management system, the set of controls, the risk assessment methodology you use for choosing controls, ties those together with the six data protection principles and with how you operate the governance framework itself, the risk and compliance auditing and management and board accountability. So privacy compliance framework is an essential uh, component is the essential component of your GDPR compliance strategy. Data protection officers are mandatory for a certain number of organizations. If you are processing substantial volumes of personal data, for instance, uh, then you're going to have to appoint a data protection officer. Most organizations, though, are not going to be caught by that. Many more will appoint a data protection officer because it's a sensible thing to do. It's not mandatory, it's sensible to do. Uh, however, if you appoint someone and they're called data protection officer, whether it's a mandatory appointment or not, if it looks, sounds, and feels like a data protection officer, it'll be treated as a data protection officer, which means that it has the same protections as a mandatory data protection officer. DPOs should be qualified. They have to have an appropriate qualification, which is a combination of legal understanding and legal knowledge with practical understanding of how to implement uh, GDPR, practical practitioner knowledge and experience. And DPOs have to report directly to senior management and are protected, which means they can't be fired because the organization doesn't like the advice which they're given. They can only be dismissed for the kind of normal reasons like um, you'd fail to turn up for work, uh, any of those kind of normal 
uh, normal items. Outside, as I said, of mandatory, it's a good practice appointment. The reality, the complexity of GDPR compliance suggests that you will want somebody who can ensure that as an organization, you're dealing appropriately and sensibly with what will be a changing GDPR compliance environment. Over the next two to five years, as GDPR becomes established, there will be a series of court cases which explore and examine how elements of the law are meant to work, and you'll need to build compliance with those into your ongoing and evolving compliance strategy. There are many other people inside the organization who need to comply with GDPR, uh, marketing staff, sales staff, HR staff. They're all going to be doing stuff that involves the collection and uh, processing of personal data, and therefore, therefore, they will need very specific training focused on their role, which enables them to understand what they're doing. Staff in general will need training as well. All staff touch on personal data. Um, you want to make sure that everybody knows how, for instance, to recognize a subject access request, which doesn't have to be made in writing, could be made virtually of anybody. So the roles and responsibilities, how that's driven down through the organization is a key part of building the accountability framework. I've talked about certification several times. The slide's really just a reminder that certifications is a mechanism for you to demonstrate that you've done the sensible thing, you've taken appropriate steps to comply with obligations which are not themselves clearly identified. Certification, and there will be new standards that will emerge, but uh, certification to existing standards, while they don't absolve the controller of the need to comply, will demonstrate that you you've made uh, practical and sensible steps to meet your compliance obligations. And then we have the challenge of international transfers. GDPR says, like the Data Protection Act before it, that any transfers of personal data outside of the jurisdiction within which it's collected are only going to be uh, legal under certain circumstances. And the primary circumstance under which it's legal is where the country to which the data is going is a country for which the European Union has made what is called an adequacy finding. It's assessed the security and the rule of law in that country and said that, yes, personal data will be as secure there as it is in the member state where it was collected. And there's only a small number of countries for whom there is an adequacy finding. Of course, all the European economic area countries are included, but outside of that, there are only 10 other countries. Australia is not on the list, the United States is not on the list, uh, the United States may never be on the list. So what do you do for those countries? Well, uh, your options include if you're an international organization, what are called binding corporate rules, which is a set of uh, legally defined requirements that you can put in place and enforce on subsidiary and member companies of the group, or you have what are called standard contract clauses, which are clauses written by the European Commissioner in which you can implement, uh, deploy exactly as written, as long as you're clear on how you will go about enforcing them on third parties. Uh, because if you put standard contract clauses in, pass, in place and the processor or the third party with whom you've contracted turns out not to be um, uh, uh, capable of upholding their end of the bargain. It's you, the controller, that will be pursued, not the processor. So the fact that there are standard contract clauses available doesn't absolve you of the obligation to make sure as a controller that you've selected the right processor for the data. Where the United States is concerned, the volume of data flows is so substantial that for some time there was what's called a safe harbor in place, which meant that organizations could register with the Department of uh, Commerce in the US and say they're complying with the Data Protection Act, and that would be a safe harbor, which would enable them to process data of uh, EU residents. Uh, that was found invalid back in 2015, uh, and uh, uh, after quite a lot of work, a new uh, EU US Privacy Shield was created, uh, which has been in place since July 2016. Now, there are and that means that any organization which is registered under the Privacy Shield, certified as being compliant with it, uh, is an organization in the US which is able to receive data from a EU uh, controller or processor as though it was in the European economic area. However, there are a couple of clouds on the horizon. The first is the most recent review of the EU-US Privacy Shield, identified a number of significant weaknesses and a requirement by the European Union on the US government to change a number of its practices around data protection. Uh, and the 
Uh, second is that uh, the same gentleman, an Austrian fellow named Schrems, who took the action which led to the European Court of Justice deciding that the uh, safe harbor framework was invalid, has just set up a NGO uh, which he's crowdfunding, it appears really very successfully, in order to bring actions against organizations which, uh, from his perspective, take a cavalier attitude to the protection of personal data. And of course, organizations which are operating not properly in compliance with the EU as Privacy Shield could find themselves as much targeted uh, by his uh, NGO as can um, any other organization. So if you're looking at international transfers, you need to think about it very carefully. It's one of the three areas, along with rights of data subjects and the data processing principles, that triggers the higher tariff of fines. As we said before, it's the independent supervisory authorities that have the power to levy fines. They're charged with educating the public, with assessing compliance, with providing guidance, but above all, uh, with making sure that the regulation is observed in the member country. One of the benefits of GDPR is it brings to multi-state organizations, companies trading in more than one member state, the opportunity to select a single lead authority and to deal with that single lead authority for all of their pan-European trading. It means that if you're based in the UK and you're trading in Germany, France, Holland, and Spain, you don't need to have relationships with the supervisory authorities in all of those countries. You can simply elect to do that with the Information Commissioner in the UK. Two things, however, fall away in March 2019, in theory, which is when, in theory, Britain leaves the European Union. The first is uh, the fact that the uh, UK will no longer be a member state, and therefore the Information Commission will no longer qualify as the supervised authority of a member state. We don't have any idea at this moment whether uh, there will be a carryover that enables a UK ICO to serve as a lead supervisory authority across Europe. We suspect perhaps not. And the second thing that happens is, of course, uh, again, we'll be outside the European Union. So if in the UK you're providing services into the European Union, you too will have to appoint a representative inside the EU uh, to whom data subjects and supervised authorities can bring actions. The European Data Protection Board exists to ensure cooperation, communication, and consistency amongst the supervisory authorities across the European Union to ensure correct application of the regulation and examine any issues that come up with where guidance is needed. Uh, overall, simply to make sure that 28 member states do pretty much the same thing in terms of the general data protection regulation. The UK's Information Commissioner had this to say at the end of that speech in January, uh, yes, accountability is a big investment. It's going to take time, effort, and determination, uh, but that, there is a payoff. You should have less uh, cost involved in looking after data. You should have less exposure. You should be able to say to customers, uh, look how much we care about your data, and you should be able to win business as a result. But she went on to say, but, you know, we recognize not everybody's going to see the positive reason for doing that. Uh, for those of you where um, you're, you're not going to rush at it, we have a lot of power to take action. And bear in mind, she says, that we're not simply going to deal with simple data breaches like somebody left a laptop on a train. What we're going to do is we're going to investigate and where we find that there has been a failure in how the organization approaches data protection, we'll find you on the basis of the substantive negligence which has left yourself open to the minor misdemeanor which you had to report. So it's about data protection by design from the outset. You should be thinking right now about how do you embed data protection in the organization, not simply how do we make it look as though we're in compliance. We think there are, broadly speaking, nine steps to pursue. Build a governance framework, proper board awareness, risk register, uh, accountability, appoint and train a data protection officer, do a data inventory, work out what personal data you've got, where it is, uh, determine what data you've no longer got a lawful basis for holding and get rid of it. A lot of that data will be old stuff. It'll be 10 and 15 years old. Uh, or the reason for which you collected it has gone. Uh, you should get rid of all of that by the by May next year. Do a data flow audit. See how data is collected and how it's transformed, what happens to it. Make sure that what you're doing with data 
is in line with what you've told the data subjects and that's in line with the six data protection principles. And do a gap analysis across the data flow. Work out all of the areas in which you're not complying with GDPR or security is inadequate. Put in place the necessary privacy notices. Make sure you've got robust legal security processes around the data supported by proper records of processing. Where necessary, do a data protection impact assessment. Uh, do that on the main big processes first and then later on go down to the uh, lesser important uh, processes. Uh, look at gaps in security, remediate all the gaps that you identify, look at how you can roll out uh, security frameworks, Cyber Essentials, ISO 27001, build your incident response and data breach reporting process. You don't want to be dealing with data breach reporting at the uh, point that you've got a breach, you want to know how you're going to do it. And make sure you're then continually monitoring, auditing, and improving how you deal with uh, data protection regulation. You want it to become an embedded part of the organization. Uh, you want to have reported to the board on a fortnight, on a quarterly basis, that across all of the areas of compliance, you're continuing to perform as required. Of course, uh, in IT governance, we can help. We can help you whether you want to help yourself or whether you uh, want a lot of help. We can provide things like pocket guides, implementation manuals, uh, templates for all the documents that might be necessary. We've got a gap analysis tool that enables you, with a bit of knowledge of what you're meant to be doing, to work out where your gaps are and therefore what you need to do to put them right. Uh, we've got a range of training courses, a foundation training course, a practitioner training course. Uh, we've got DPIA uh, workshops. Uh, the first two bring certificates. The third is simply a workshop. All of them can be delivered uh, in-house as well as in our public venues up and down the UK and increasingly across Europe as well as online. Uh, we've got a range of consultancy services which start with gap analysis, go through data flow audits, uh, implementing information security management systems, cyber health checks and the like, and of course a data protection officer as a service because there is no requirement on you to employ a data protection officer. You can appoint somebody on a part-time basis, you can appoint somebody for six hours a week or whatever is appropriate for the needs of the organization. And to have an appropriately skilled and qualified uh, DPO in, uh, in an organization is not necessarily that easy, but you can get a DPO as a service offering from an organization like ours. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the prepared portion of this webinar. Uh, enables me then to start looking at questions. And just a reminder, if you do have questions, there's a uh, question uh, section in the GoToWebinar drop-down uh, panel. Please do type questions if you have them in there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first question as asked, and then I'm going to read them out, and I'm going to share with you the answer. I'm going to get through as many as we can by the time we get to four o'clock. Uh, so, uh, GDPR and DPO is mandatory for businesses over 250 employees, also applies to smaller organizations. If data processing carried out is not occasional, if I had a small business of 10 employees and I process their working hours weekly, then outsource my payroll function does this weekly occurrence mean this is no longer occasional, therefore GDPR applies. Yes, that is correct. Um, you're not only processing payroll, you're collecting their information in order to employ them. Uh, you're also going to have a couple of customers. I don't know how many, but you will collect information from customers, names and contact details. Even if that is uh, business details, all of that is personal information. The nature of occasional processing, uh, while that remains to be clearly defined in case law, um, doesn't appear to include the kind of regular processing that you have to do because you're employing people. Uh, yes, you can get a recording. I believe a recording will be made available in due course. In a practical sense, would there not be difficulties in enforcement against a non-EU entity which breaches GDPR? Given jurisdictional issues, how far would model clauses go in abrogating this difficulty of enforcement? Well, um, the challenge is on you, the controller. So if you, the controller in the United in the EU uh, put standard model clauses in place with a processor outside the European Union and you choose one in a country where you're not going to be able to enforce your 
contract, then you, the controller, will suffer. The information commissioner, for one, has been crystal clear that under those circumstances, they will apply GDPR as written, which is it's the controller that is um, uh, uh, responsible for, accountable for how and where data is processed. Um, you do have a right of clawback against the processor, but it's up to you to make sure it's enforceable. So in practical terms, model clauses work if you, the controller, make them work. Pseudonymization, is this necessary for all businesses? No, it's not. Um, pseudonymization is simply a recognized technique. Uh, it's a technique for securing data. There's not a lot of technologies currently available that pseudonymize data properly. Encryption is an alternative. Encryption is much more easily available. All you're trying to do with techniques like encryption and pseudonymization is to make it close to impossible for an unauthorized intruder to access the information of uh, personal data subjects. Of course, our HR department also holds personnel data necessary to perform their duties in line with employment legislation. Of course, it does. Uh, no question. So they need to know what they're doing. Presumably, regardless of level of seniority of the DPO, that individual has to be given a significant degree of leeway within their organization to be able to highlight any GDPR shortcomings without fear of being ignored. That's absolutely right. Um, if you're going to appoint a, appoint a DPO, uh, they have to be able to report on what they see, and they can't be conflicted by other duties. So, for instance, it's very difficult for the head of IT also to be the DPO because in many instances, the head of IT will be involved in or responsible for determining the means, if not also the purposes of processing. And GDPR explicit, explicitly prohibits that kind of a conflict of interest. The DPO has to be someone who, without fear of uh, favor or um, uh, banishment can give advice to those who are determining the means and purposes of processing and can give it at the highest level inside the organization. Does monitoring a public space mean a physical space or can it include cyberspace that is accessible to all? As GDPR is written and as I understand it, um, it's a physical space, so it's dealing with CCTVs. Um, if you are processing the data of a large number of data subjects, um, uh, for instance, in a big data application, you're not uh, monitoring data subjects in a public space, you're processing data, um, and uh, you're certainly caught by GDPR. We are a investigation company working on behalf of insurers and solicitors. Am I therefore right in thinking that we, as the processor, do not need to gain consent for data subject, as our client, a controller, would have gained this? Well, um, Following our report, would we have to destroy our report? So uh, in all of these cases, yes, I think it is likely that you are the processor for each of these processing activities. The basis on which your controller and you need to have a contract which tells you what you have to do, um, it's up to the controller to determine the lawful basis of the processing. And it may well be legitimate interest, not consent. Remember, consent is your um, is the thing you fall back to if you can't find a better lawful basis. And so uh, organizations have a legitimate interest in tracing debtors, their owed money. Uh, you can't ask a debtor to consent to uh, the use of their information to um, uh, to pursue them because they'll then say no. If you ask for consent and rely on consent and they withdraw consent, you're stymied. So don't ask for consent. What you do is you tell the person to whom you're lending money that um, you will use their data to pursue them and you have a legitimate interest in doing so. Uh, they can object, but you have an overriding uh, reason to continue doing that, which is in order to settle a law case, for instance. Uh, no, you don't have to destroy your report unless your contract with the controller requires you to do that. So what you have to do in all of these areas is make sure that the contract you have with your clients, who are the controllers, sets out clearly what you have have to do to protect personal data, and then that's what you do. Do cloud companies storing and processing a marketing campaign based in the US under the EU-US Privacy Shield? Uh, yes. So if you're using a cloud company which is in the US and you're putting personal data in there and you're a EU company, you need to make sure that they're registered uh, and, and certified uh, under the EU US Privacy Shield. Otherwise, you have a potential problem, even as a micro business. 
Um, what if the processor and controller are the same? So that's just a definitional thing. Uh, the assumption of GDPR is that a controller will also process the information which it collects. It defines a processor as a third party to whom a controller outsources the processing of information. So a controller is doing everything that it wants to do. It can, um, every form of processing, it can share it internally, archive it. Um, as soon as it sends it to a third party organization, an outside organization, that organization is defined as a processor. Problem I'm still having is how this affects my company. I work for a small design company, eight staff strong. Eight staff strong. The only data we collect is email subscriptions. How does this affect us? Well, you have eight staff, so you collect the personal data of eight people. Um, you have some customers. Uh, I don't know how many customers you've got, but you'll collect the personal information of those customers. Uh, they're all entitled to um, have their rights protected. You may have a website which people visit uh, to find out about your services, all of the uh, data which you gather about people on your website if they ask you to send them information about you, for instance. All of that personal data has to be protected under GDPR. So while you're a small company, the obligation to comply is just as straightforward. The documentation necessary is substantially less because there's a derogation that says that companies under 250 uh, employees don't need the same level of documentation if there is no risk to rights and freedoms of natural persons. Can be a difficult test to prove, but uh, nevertheless, you've got a, an option there. What happens with staff and secondments in and out of the EU? When does personal information fall under GDPR? It falls under GDPR if you, the controller or processor, are based in the uh, EU or are providing services into it. So if you're a, an organization based in the European Union and you have a member of staff working in South Africa, uh, but you're processing their data inside the European Union, GDPR applies to that person's data because of where you're based, not because of where they're based. If you're seconding staff into and out of the European Union, uh, again, it's going to depend on where you're based. Uh, it's likely that uh, if you're putting staff into the European Union, you're providing services into the European Union. So I, I kind of suspect that under those circumstances, an organization, you have to comply in any case. Uh, no, there are no areas specific to a charity, by which I mean that there are no exemptions for charities. Charities have just the same obligations as do any other type of organization under GDPR, which can be horrendous because the fines can be painful for charities as they are for anybody else, and charities have even less money available to pay fines than anybody else. We have a jurisdiction in Hong Kong, another in the USA. What are obligations in terms of contracts with these? It depends entirely on who you are. If you're a European Union organization, then you're on the hook for processing. If people in those two jurisdictions can access data in the European Union, uh, then they're processing it. The definition of processing includes accessing or just taking a look at, and so you would have to ensure you extend GDPR compliance to those entities. Will GDPR apply to not-for-profit organizations in the US that do not directly target the UK, EU market? Um, there may be EU citizens that subscribe to the newsletters. That's really on the borderline. The GDPR definition is that um, an organization to uh, be caught has to be providing services into the European Union. And the, the, the demonstration that you're providing services would be that you uh, encourage people in the UK to sign up or that you have delivery details in the UK. But GDPR does also seem to be clear that the very fact of a European Union citizen choosing to buy something from you doesn't necessarily force you outside the EU to comply with GDPR. If it's an occasional uh, use and it's not as a result of you providing services, then I think that uh, you're in the clear. Um, and frankly, uh, 
from a commercial point of view, you're going to assume you're in the clear because somebody's going to need to want to bring an action against you, which means that um, they're going to need to be able to demonstrate that in some way their rights have been transgressed um, uh, or there's been the kind of damage which makes this a reasonable court case. And if it's only happening every now and then you're a charity, I would say the chances are pretty slim. But don't take my word, speak to your lawyers and get proper advice. Uh, yes, correct. Sorry, I'm uh, just kind of reading questions out and I'm trying not to identify who asked the questions. Uh, you mentioned the first question, something like under 250 employees, a DPO is mandatory. No, it's not mandatory. There is the, the mandating of a DPO relates to the type of processing you're doing. So if you're processing special categories of data on a large scale, it's mandatory to have a data protection officer. If you're processing uh, data of large scale, you're doing large scale processing of data subjects in a public area, it's mandatory to have a data protection officer. And there are a couple of similar kinds of requirements. Otherwise, it is not mandatory. It is voluntary. And the voluntary decision, yes, means that you'll still have to comply with GDPR's description of a DPO, but you, it's voluntary uh, and you do that because you recognize that having somebody who knows what they're doing is a good way to stay out of trouble. But no, you do not have to have a DPO uh, unless you fall into one of those uh, areas for which it's explicitly defined as being mandatory. Um, what do web processors need to do? You're a web development company, you maintain customer websites, uh, you need to decide whether you're a controller or a processor, um, you need to talk to your customers, you need to talk to your lawyers. Um, it's entirely possible that you are controllers providing a service to your customers. Uh, it's entirely possible that one of those services might involve being a processor. So you need to look at the data that you're collecting and determine which of the data you are being given by your customers as distinct from which data you are collecting yourself and that will help you determine how you go about your compliance activity there. Uh, many people use email marketing applications often on US platforms, uh, data retained for management to opt out, but you can have no control over that data. Uh, if you've got a US platform, you need to make sure it's uh, um, uh, operating under a, the EU US Privacy Shield. If you have uh, email data, you need to make sure it's lawfully collected. You need to make sure it's being lawfully maintained. So certainly opt out or um, objection or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, we just ran out of uh, time. We ran out of time about five minutes ago. Uh, there are a number of other questions. I'm sorry we're not going to have time to get to this, uh, but I hope you found the webinar uh, useful. Uh, there will be an ongoing series of webinars in the new year, both an ongoing set of first step webinars plus webinars dealing with specific aspects of GDPR. Uh, they're all going to continue being free. Uh, you can access, of course, all of our range of products and services which can help you get GDPR compliant. We've got a very substantial and still growing team of uh, GDPR specialists as well as information security management specialists and a whole range of helpful product services and software that can help you in one way or another get yourself to the point where you're not contemplating with any fear the potential for large administrative fines or indeed for data subjects bringing actions against you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for being on this webinar to wish you uh, good luck with your uh, GDPR journey. And of course, just to finish off by reminding you that on Christmas Day, the 25th of December, there will be just five months left to the point by which you need to be compliant with GDPR. And so I wish you a very happy and enjoyable first five months of 2018. Thank you and good afternoon.